Christina Mann. How are you? Thank you. Thank you so much. Today, all of us gathered here to welcome Ambassador Zhang Jianming, the new Council General of People's Republic of China in San Francisco. So please join me to give him a round of applause. First of all, I would like to thank to Mayor Willie Brown and Mr. Louis Lam, who made today's event possible. Thank you, thank you so much. We're going to start with the forum. So I would like to also thanks to the sponsor for today's forum, Mr. Wang Jingling, Wang Jingling Lao And also Mr. Ken Fang. Thank you. I will be your moderator today. My name is Diana Ding. I'm a grassroots entrepreneur, founder and CEO of Silicon Valley Community Media and Ding Ding TV. We have been the voice of Asian Americans in Silicon Valley for the last 14 years. Ding Ding TV has organized hundreds of events, bring people together, bring our community together. It's truly my honor uh, to be here and to work with Mr. Louis Lam. I also served at Cupertino Rotary Club as a board, and also the, as a board member of Silicon Valley Central Chamber of Commerce and Civic Leadership USA. I was elected as the president of U.S.-China Chamber of Commerce Silicon Valley since 2019 till now. I spent half of my time in China and in the United States. So as a daughter of both countries, I'm very proud of my countries and love deeply to the people and to the country. So I always ask myself, why we are here, what do we stand for? And I hope that we can work together to contribute the understanding and the friendship between people. Thank you. So currently, the U.S.-China relationship is in a critical historical moment with challenges and opportunities. Today's forum, we are going to discuss how do we really look at each other and what we can learn from each other and how can we work together. We have two distinguished speakers and one moderator. So I'm going to give you a brief introduction about them because the detailed introdu introduction will take three hours at least. First of all, I'm going to give you a short introduction of Ambassador Zhang Jianming. Uh, I found the Chinese information and translate this into English. So, Mr. Zhang Jianming is the Council General of People's Republic of China in San Francisco. He used to be one of the national leading translators and interpreters. He served as the English interpreter for many important global leaders, such as President Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, and George W. Bush. Zhang Jianming was born in Hangzhou city and his parents were workers in a factory. He has been a top student always, graduated from the Shanghai International Studies University and has studied in the London School of Economics and Political Science. He has a master degree in science. In 2018, he was appointed as an ambassador of the People's Republic of China in Zak Republic. February, 2020, uh, February 2022, he came to San Francisco and became the new Council General of People's Republic of China in San Francisco. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me and welcome Ambassador Zhang Jianming <laughs> to the stage. Yes, thank you. Next, I will introduce our Honorable Mr. Willie Brown. 
two-term mayor of San Francisco, legendary speaker of California State Assembly, and widely regarded as the most influential African-American politician of 20th century. Mr. Brown has been the center of California polit politics, government, and civic life for over 40 years. His career spans the American presidency from Lindy Johnson to George W. Bush. And he's worked with every California governor from Pat Brown to Arnold Schwarzenegger. From civil rights to education reform, tax policy, economic development, healthcare, international trade, domestic partnership, and affirmative action. Today, he heads the Willie L. Brown Jr. Institute on Politics and Public Service, where this acknowledged master of the art of politics shared his knowledges and skills and wisdom with the new generation of California leaders. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Honorable Mr. Willie Brown. Next, I would like to invite the moderator for today's panel, and I invited my friend and mentor, Mr. Zhou Wang. Zhou is the chair of National Asian Americans United, the president of Chinese American Politic, Pol Political Association. He has been serving Asian American community for over 30 years after he retired from a high-tech company. He is an advisor on APIA issues for Ding Ding TV and the editor of Silicon Valley Community Media. He wrote lots of articles on his blog, www.jewwang.net, about anti-Asian hate, Asian American contributions to the United States, and also promote the good relationship between United States and China. China. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome Mr. Zhou Wang. Thank you, Diana, for that great introduction. When a friend comes from a long distance, we want to welcome them. So let's welcome Ambassador Jiang. Uh, we are really delighted that he made time to come and see us. Uh, my first question is, the U.S.-China relationship is probably the most important issue around our world, yet, uh, about a year ago, in uh, March of last year, uh, the Pew Survey did a sur survey of American attitude, and they found out that 89% of the Americans have a very negative view of China. And, I, I, and, and, I, and my question is, what do you think are the reasons for the conflict between our countries, and what could we do together to improve it? First of all, I'd like to say thank you for your warm welcome. I feel very much at home, and the welcome gives me the confidence and the courage to work even harder to get our relationship right. You mentioned the problems in our relationship. I do recognize that there is tension in our relationship, and uh, our relationship at the moment is not healthy. In addition to the pandemic, the natural virus that is making exchanges and cooperation somewhat more difficult, I'm more concerned and worried about the political virus that is uh, troubling our relationship. Our two countries are having the most important relationship that will have a bearing not just on the well-being of our two peoples, but also the people throughout the world. Our two presidents have just spoken on the phone, and at the phone conversation, President Xi of China said that the people of our two countries and the people of the whole world 
expect China and the United States to take the lead in ensuring world peace and security and in promoting global development and prosperity. We are two major countries, and this is the responsibility we have to the whole world and to the people, our two countries in particular. So to improve the relationship, I think it's important to start with uh, dialogue and discussion based on mutual respect. Dr. Kissinger has always been a strong advocate of interaction based on mutual respect. And he wisely cautioned against the uh, problem of self-fulfilling prophecies. If we view each other as the primary rival, if China is viewed by the United States as the most serious long-term challenge, then you will probably fall into the trap of turning a very good friend and partner into a future enemy and adversary. Our two countries should have been engaged in productive cooperation in dealing with so many global challenges together. You know, people talk about the importance of building a better world. I think we need to recognize that we will have a better chance of success in bringing about a better world if we cooperate with each other rather than confront or even engage in a conflict with each other. So, so why not cooperate? Why not uh, engage each other in a joint endeavor to look for comprehensive global solutions? As for the problem in the survey, I think it's a temporary problem uh, because uh, since uh, the Trump administration, there has been lots of uh, disinformation, misinformation going on. So I think uh, China has been a victim of those kind of uh, unhealthy move uh, to uh, cause misunderstanding and to uh, throw unjustified and unwarranted accusations against China on so many issues. Uh, so many things have been politicized and people, some politicians instead of people, are just being so ideological and they play the scapegoating game so well that uh, they are competing with each other in playing tough against China in order to achieve political correctness. But this is wrong. I know that today, present here, we have many mayors and the former mayors and uh, elected officers and officials uh, people who hold public office. And uh, the value that we all hold very dear to our hearts is uh, public service, to serve the people. So I think for those in important positions, be it on Capitol Hill or in White House or in city government, state government, I think it's important to act in a responsible manner to put the interests of the people at the center. And in terms of our bilateral relationship, I think we need to see beyond the uh, important value of a healthy and cooperative bilateral relationship because too much is at stake. And we owe it to the whole world to work for an improved relationship and more mutual understanding. And I think if people start to see this uh, good turn of events and start to feel the benefits, which actually there are many, uh, then uh, their opinion would also improve. Actually, President Biden in the conversation also said that cooperation between our two countries benefits not just the two peoples, but also the people of the world. And we hope that uh, in the interest of win-win cooperation, a lot more uh, can be done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh
Thank you for your answer. I want to dig a little bit deeper, and I'm going to ask you what three things the United States are doing right, and what three things the United States can improve on in our relationship. And similarly, what three things China is doing right, and what three things China can improve on to improve the relationship. Would you like to go first? <laughs> Hey, I, I have a very good question saved for him, okay? <laughs> Wait till the last. I have a good question for you. <laughs> you know, as I said earlier, we are two major countries in the world, and our relationships are rich in substance, and they uh, come across such a variety of areas, a wide variety of areas. If you ask me what are the things that we are doing right in a positive direction, I think three are not enough. <laughs> what we are doing right, first of all, I think we are advocating mutual respect. The Chinese president has long suggested in all the previous conversations with the US presidents that we need to get our relationship right in accordance with three principles. One is mutual respect. Second, peaceful coexistence. Then third, win-win cooperation. I think this is very important as a guidance of our relationship because without mutual respect, how can you build trust? And if you have no trust, then the car, it's just like a car without gas. You could hardly get anywhere. So I think this is uh, something that reflects Chinese philosophy and I think it's something we feel very proud of ourselves of you know, advocating. And the second thing we are doing right is uh, we are trying to encourage more dialogue and conversation. Uh, our two presidents have had uh, five rounds of uh, conference, uh, meetings, discussions, most recently just uh, yesterday, Beijing time. Uh, and our two foreign ministers uh, have also been talking with each other. So we are very encouraged that in the recent conversation between the two heads of state, both sides agree to keep the line of communication open. I think only through dialogue and conversation can we have more mutual understanding of each other's position and we'll be able to advance cooperation where we can, and uh, manage properly the differences. So hopefully, we'll be able to get over. The third thing we are doing right, uh, I think, is the continuation of a very dynamic exchanges uh, between people to people. Despite the difficulties caused by the pandemic, despite the travel you know, disruptions, we still have uh, a huge population of Chinese students studying here. Uh, right now, I think the figure stands at about 310,000 uh, Chinese students throughout the country. And uh, I know many American students, you know, they have also uh, been looking very much forward to going to China uh, as an exchange student or to to join some host family to learn more about China and Chinese culture. So I'm very encouraged by the preparedness and enthusiasm among the young people, the teenagers, uh, to reach out to each other, to explore different things, and to enrich their own perception. So I think the inclusiveness and the diversity especially among the young people, would lead to a better future of our relationship. Uh, before here, I was uh, recently in Seattle uh, last week, and there I visited a high school and I taught the uh, American kids how to play ping pong. <laughs> <laughs> they were quite shy in the beginning, but after a while, after I demonstrated some difficult you know, tricks, uh, <laughs> Uh, they were 
you know, so amazed and developed uh, a lot of interest. So everybody just want to, you know, practice with me. And uh, I've also had the opportunity to watch the grand final game between the Warriors and Celtic. I think we've also got a lot to learn from the US in terms of basketball. And coming back to the importance of people-to-people -people exchanges, I just want to share with you one exciting piece of news. China's women national football team has already arrived in San Francisco, not the men's, <laughs> women's, which uh, is really you know, first class. And uh, uh, so I, I think uh, with these kind of exchanges, uh, people between our peoples, there will be more uh, understanding and uh, closer friendship. Thank you. Uh, when I knew, found out that Willie Brown is going to be in the forum, I asked our mutual friend, May Li Tong. You know her, right? You <laughs> asked what question should I ask Willie? And she said that uh, Willie, she is disappointed that you not run for the presidency of the United States. <laughs> and uh, and uh, my question to you from May Li is, what kind of advice do you have for our president and our present administration in re re regards to the U.S.-China relationship? Well, let me first start by extending a welcome uh, to the Council General, uh, who has now joined us here for the next, I think, three years at least, or not more. And I'm sure that all of you who heard his response to the very, very good questions put to him about the U.S.-China relations, and you heard him walk through very carefully and very accurately for everybody to understand exactly the nature and the quality of the answers that ought to be offered when questions of this nature are presented. It was frankly almost as if he was still at the UN discussing <laughs> Uh, every aspect, and uh, there was a great amount of attention paid by everybody here, Mr. Council General, and I must tell you that I think they were all equally as eager to hear you. And for those of you who are hearing me now, you should know that I had the great pleasure several years ago of working with the Council General. He was at that time the interpreter, and the uh, I was uh, visit in uh, China, it was in Beijing, and it was an occasion uh, when the sister city conversations and relationships between San Francisco uh, and Shanghai uh, was under uh, scrutiny and being reviewed uh, by everybody. Uh, I did not understand anything that he said when he interpreted what I said. Uh, uh, but I assume that it was good because the relations improved substantially, substantially. And so, Mr. Council General, I am uh, frankly uh, amazed at how uh, well you have command of the subject matter that needs to be discussed and handled appropriately. In your comment about the need for dialogue uh, between the two nations, dialogue between the peoples of the nations, and your example of some of the things that uh, are being done that clearly demonstrates uh, an outreach. In regards to the matter of what I would say or do uh, with uh, this nation, and what I would say to uh, President Biden, as well as all of the other elected officials in the U.S. who are involved, I must say, first and foremost, that there are multiple nations on the planet of this earth, and very few of those nations have the same kind of method of government and the operations of government. Those distinctions between the respective nations, as you most appropriately said, must be understood 
and must be mutually respected because they do not, in most cases, involve any kind of confrontation over territory or anything of that nature. The kind of understanding uh, that comes from listening as well as talking is what ultimately would uh, resolve and put, present the opportunity for a resolution of any kinds of disagreements that various nations should have. And certainly, the USA and the People's Republic of China are in a position where that kind of dialogue uh, needs to take place. It was, I think, almost 40 years ago uh, when I got selected as one of the elected officials uh, following or the uh, removal of the differences for even dialogue between the US and China. And I was on, I think, the second delegation to be sent by this country uh, to China when uh, Kissinger and, and uh, his group had uh, done the convincing of this government, the US government, and somehow the counterpart of Kissinger in the People's Republic of China had done the same kind of persuasive activity and uh, we were beginning to send mutual delegations for dialogue. Ordinary people, elected officials, appointed officials, and it was just absolutely amazing. It was before Peking was changed to Beijing. It was before a whole series of things but that, had, that occurred since that beginning dialogue. But I must tell you that in the process of the dialogue, it became very clear that these two very powerful, very strong nations needed to be working together for humankind. And that's what happened in the late 60s, the early 70s, and the 80s, and all the way through my time period as the mayor of San Francisco, all the way into the 21st century, there was constant improvement of relations between the two nations. No matter what disagreements they may have had, there never was an occasion when there would be anything like it is today. In the last 12 or 15 years, that concept of mutual relationships and mutual respect has been somewhat abandoned. I would say to my president, look at how the relationship between China and the USA really began on a friendship basis in the time period that I previously related. Because there were obviously distinctions between the governing process, there was a distinction between the economy, economic process, there were distinctions uh, in regards to the whole business of the labor relationships, if any, there were distinctions with reference to the health coverage. But all of those distinctions did not create a level of distrust and a level of disrespect as we are experiencing today. We ought to go back and review how did we do it so early on? How did we become ultimately the two most powerful nations on this planet? And in view of that capacity and that title and that status, we have a responsibility to save the planet. And we are the two nations that can in fact save the planet. Our resources were superior to every other nation on the planet of this earth. Our level of intellectual powerness is superior to almost any other place on this planet. We can provide collectively the leadership that will address all of the issues that affects humankind without an intruding upon how people govern themselves, period. And if I had any advice to give to President Biden, I would say that President Barack Obama earned uh, the Nobel Peace Prize 
during the time that he was serving as president. And he got that Nobel Peace Prize because of an extraordinary ability to exceed the internal politics of this nation as he addressed it, the issues. I would say, President Biden, work to become the next Nobel laureate. All for your heaven begin to have China and the USA address the problems of the world as teammates. You will have an adequate amount of time when you two teammates have solved all the other problems to solve the problems between the two of you. Thank you. Very well said. Uh, about a week ago, uh, Europe was going through a heat wave. You know, a lot of them are beginning to understand what global warming is all about. Obviously, we all live in the same planet, and the environmental problem is a common problem. Uh, you're going to be here for the next three years, and uh, you're going to. What is your agenda? What do you hope to be accomplished as a Council General of San Francisco in all in, in this area? Uh, as a new Council General, well, first of all, thank you, uh, Mayor Brown, for your advice that you are going to give to your leader. And uh, really, I appreciate the very remarkable contribution you and many others in the, state of San, in the state of California and the city and county of San Francisco in particular. Uh, the contribution you have made to the progress of our relationship at various, uh, you know, at, in, at all levels, between, with China and with Shanghai in particular. Uh, talking about my mission, uh, my primary task is to advance exchanges and cooperation at a sub-national level and promote uh, mutual understanding and friendship between our peoples. And of course, at the same time, I would also work hard to defend the legitimate rights and interests of Chinese citizens and organizations. Uh, talking about uh, the practical cooperation between our two sides. I think uh, given the uh, mutual complementarity and the greater interdependence between our two sides, we each have a lot to offer. And uh, the recent example could be uh, the trade relationship. We could do a lot more to further enhance our trade ties. Uh, in 2021, the trade volume between China and US stood at seven 150 billion US dollars. And uh, that's an increase of over 28% over the previous year. And I think trade is a good example where you can see mutual benefit. It supports millions of jobs. Trade supports, uh, trade with China supports uh, like 2.6 million US jobs. And I think it also supports a lot of jobs in China as well. So it improves people's livelihood, and we need to do more. China is going to host the fifth international import exhibition. And we are very glad that uh, the state of California has been very active in participating in the import exposition in Shanghai. Our trade with uh, the state of California had also been at the forefront of uh, China's trade with various US states. Uh, you, China is your biggest uh, trading partner and your biggest source of import and also one of the most important export destinations. In the first five months of this year, our trade, I think, stood at, uh, let me see, it's uh, about uh, 160 billion US dollars. And uh, that, that, that was the, sorry, uh, 160 billion dollars was the trade between China and State of California last year. And uh, this year, in the first five months, it was already approaching 70 billion US dollars. So uh, both are registering an increase of over 12% respectively. So 
we feel that this is an area we can do even more. And that's the reason why we are proposing to the US government that Section 301 tax should be, you know, got rid of. Because it actually doesn't serve the US interest alone. The US consumers and households are bearing most of the burden. Each family has to pay 1,300 US dollars more every year just because of the Section 301 tariff. Uh, so we think we need to uh, get things right and engage more meaningful you know, cooperation. Uh, climate change, uh, I think, is a very good area where we would cooperate. China's uh, Minister of Environment and Ecology uh, just recently uh, visited the United States and he and Governor Newsom met in DC. Uh, they exchanged views on how to strengthen cooperation. Between China and the state of California in particular, we have very good mechanisms for cooperation in the field of climate change. We have the uh, joint working group and we also have established uh, the uh, joint uh, center at the University of Berkeley. It's a joint venture between uh, Tsinghua University and the uh, University of Berkeley to do more research on climate change related issues. So my job is to promote more practical cooperation that will serve interest for both sides. And also I'm going to promote more mutual understanding. Uh, for instance, uh, we will have uh, more cultural exhibitions and we will have more exchange of uh, students and uh, people you know, in all areas to promote more understanding. And thirdly, I'm also going to do what I can to, better prov to provide a better environment for our Chinese nationals and Chinese companies to do their business here. Because the hate crime against Asians and against the Chinese has been a concern. Uh, the crime rates between 2020 to 2021 actually uh, climbed by over 500%, which was shocking to me. So we hope that, uh, you know, most, many of you are mayors, and uh, I think we hope that uh, the mayors in, in China and the mayors here uh, can also talk with each other more to compare notes and share experience. Because mayors, in my opinion, they take care of everyday needs of their people. And they are the ones that are most connected with people's needs. They feel their pain. They know what people want. So mayors in China and mayors in the US probably have a lot of common language. So they can work together to build a safer, stronger, and more prosperous city you know, in each other's country. Uh, I've been told that our time is up. I want to have Mr. Brown say the last word, uh, la what, the last sentence for you, and then we're going to have the Council General say the other word. And then we'll, well, Mr. Council General, uh, it would be, uh, I think, um, not complete unless I acknowledged that in our country there are political distinctions made between many of us who live here and have the right to vote here. And sometimes we spend more time in pursuit of trying to gain the power to make a decision without letting the world know here uh, what decision we would make if they gave us the power or if they embraced us. And that creates a problem for people like President Biden because he has constantly to be conscious of being politically correct on things within his own country uh, before he can in any manner assert what he should do abroad. And on many cases when he doesn't do that or hasn't done it politically correct enough to generate support, 
he has the problem of having the criticism leveled at the time that he is attempting to assert something on behalf of his nation. He's got other folk at home raising questions about whether or not he's authorized, whether or not he's competent, whether or not he's capable, and that really presents a problem. I uh, uh, frankly am amazed at uh, how your top leader doesn't have to suffer through that uh, too much, uh, but we are, as a nation, um, still in a position where our Constitution guarantees people the right uh, to do that kind of thing, but the Constitution did not offer a method by which political correctness could be uh, overcome, uh, period. And we constantly, as elected officials, are in the business of trying to overcome through the political correctness process. And you are correct when you say that the mayors of this country are really the hard-working persons that every day of their lives have to be responsive to a constituency that constantly demands a response from government. And in many cases, it's government that uh, in, in, in a way in which they are not in control because the people who are at the state level or at the federal level may have a different attitude or a different view. So the challenge to be a mayor and to provide the leadership is a very tough one. I enjoyed doing it because frankly, at the time that I was the mayor, I didn't put up with uh, the pursuit of political correctness. And they have altered the opportunity for mayors uh, to be able to ignore that now, but I ignored it. And I had a lot of fun doing it. Thank you. Uh, we'll <laughs> We want to welcome the Council General once more and let him have the last word, okay? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think uh, to not put up with political correctness really requires uh, political courage and political vision. I think to do what is right and to stand on the right side of history is very important. So between our two countries, our relationship is important. It is consequential. And the guiding documents of our relationship are the three Sino-U.S. joint communiques. And it's a serious international commitment. And we really hope that such commitment to one China, to good relationship, will be honored on both sides. So far, we are frustrated that sometimes the U.S. is uh, applying double standards. The question of Taiwan, is the most important and sensitive one. And uh, it involves China's sovereignty and territorial integrity. And I think uh, in US history, uh, we all know what the US did, or what the then US leader, Abraham Lincoln, did to keep the nation intact. So I think we in China will do our very best to strive for peaceful reunification. But in the event of the worst case, then we would do whatever it takes to keep China's territory intact and to uphold our national sovereignty. And we hope that this message could be got across very clearly to certain members of the US Congress. And we hope that uh, both sides will work together for our mutual interests and for peace and stability, development and prosperity of the whole world. I'm still optimistic and I'm determined to work hard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's give them a big hand. <laughs>